What I'd really like to do is uh, welcome everybody uh, to uh, what is a very exciting day for us, uh, the opening and kickoff of the Molecular Engineering and Science Institute, um, and uh, the MOLIES building as well. Um, I'd like to first uh, welcome our outside visitors and speakers. Uh, we have a really exciting lineup uh, in the clean tech and biotech areas, and, and uh, we're super enthused uh, that you could be here to help us celebrate. Um, and especially for the University of Washington people, um, this is really our day to celebrate this um, incredible new facility and all the hard work that's gone into it um, and to have a great uh, scientific and engineering uh, kickoff uh, to the institute and to the building. Uh, the building and the institute have actually already started uh, and I'm excited to say that. Uh, we, we already have exciting research going on uh, we have an institute that has started up. Uh, we have 14 different departments. Um, we set out to uh, make this an interdisciplinary research institute that's set apart from departments but worked with departments. And um, from our 75 faculty from 14 departments, you can th see that we're well on our way. In addition, uh, we uh, have uh, been successful in starting up uh, an incredible new facility uh, for all of campus, the molecular analysis facility that you'll be able to see during our tour this afternoon. It houses uh, four major instrumentation centers already. Um, we already have many more uh, uh, instrumentation uh, pieces uh, that, that we have submitted grants for. So this is going to become a, a real jewel at the campus um, and something that will be broadly impactful. Um, we also have three research centers um, already in place and again a lot of hard work is going into uh, increasing our center impact at the Institute. So what I want to do is just give you a little bit of background on the Institute and uh, any background on the Molecular Engineering and Sciences Institute really has to start with one person. And maybe it's not hard to stand apart as a giant of molecular engineering, um, a giant amongst molecules, um, but he is. Uh, and he's the uh, dean of uh, the College of Engineering, Matt O'Donnell. This was really Matt's vision. Uh, it was uh, what he advocated for. Uh, it was part of his uh, recruiting package when he came to the University of Washington. Um, and what an exciting day for Matt um, and for all of us who had the great pleasure of working with him to achieve his vision. Um, when he came here, uh, the idea was maybe a little vague, but it was to incorporate new breakthroughs in molecular science um, in our ability to make molecules, to assemble them, um, and to make that a cornerstone of engineering fields, a broad array of engineering fields, and I think you'll see that today amongst the speakers, the broad impact of engineering molecules um, across different engineering departments, across the clean tech and biotech uh, theme areas. So just a brief history. Um, in in five years ago, it's a little hard to believe, in 2007, uh, then Provost Phyllis Wise uh, commissioned a committee to vision out what this would really look like at the University of Washington. And I was uh, proud to chair this um, and to work with an incredible group of faculty, top faculty from across campus. And so we had people uh, from engineering, we had people from arts and sciences, and people from medicine um, who really came together and tackled some difficult issues of what this institute would look like, how it would be organizationally placed at the university. Um, and it was a terrific time. We uh, worked together extremely well and um, we came back with the recommendation first to change the name um, from molecular engineering to molecular engineering and sciences and underneath that I think is something very important and it's foundational to the Institute that um, to do engineering you have to be super closely uh, aligned and, and interconnected with 
um, the evolving field that underlies it. And in this case, it's, again, how do we make new molecules and macromolecules, and how do we assemble them? And so that creates an interface between engineering and sciences that's very exciting. Um, the Institute is, uh, was initially supported um, by uh, the COE, uh, ANS, and the provost. Um, and at the time, uh, Anamari was the dean. She's since, of course, moved up to uh, the provost level. We had Matt. Um, and also the vice provost re research, Mary Lidstrom, was super important and, and really imparted a lot of wisdom um, with her experience in setting up these interdisciplinary uh, uh, centers or institutes. Um, and then uh, for Maine S, uh, right from the start, a very imper important person who I'd like to acknowledge was the divisional dean, Werner Stutzel. Um, and this is not a photoshopped um, picture. This is really what they look like. I, I, I couldn't tell you how many fun trips I had around the building with important people wearing these white uh, hard hats at awkward angles on their uh, head. <laughs> Um, but uh, we had a great time, and uh, I, I certainly want to thank you all. It was uh, a demanding process, um, but one that was led superbly by all of you. Um, the Moly S Institute itself um, has a, a relatively simple bullet point list of what it wants to do. We want to catalyze interdisciplinary research in two main areas, clean tech and biotech. And you're going to see with the speakers today um, an outline of the future in these two areas. We wanted these talks to be forward-looking as well as to give you some examples of the uh, kind of research that these stars are doing in their own lab. But, but it's really about the future. Um, and these are obviously two areas of huge societal impact. And that's what the Institute would like to do. It would like to catalyze groups of faculty, really top groups of faculty from across campus to tackle these grand challenge types of problems. Um, we also, as I mentioned, wanted to create this molecular analysis facility that continues to grow, and, and, and I can promise you we are just going to make this a world-class uh, facility for all of campus. Um, we also have an education mission. Um, we wanted to uh, build um, both at the graduate and undergraduate level, and I wanted to mention that um, uh, Professor Renee Orvernay has uh, been the leader of that, putting tons of work into this. There are a lot of interesting issues and challenges with building programs, that education programs that lie outside of departments. But I think we all recognize their importance. Um, and we have to struggle through from an organizational standpoint how to do this better. And Renee has been uh, leading that up with a, a great staff person, Tiffany Dion. Um, we'd also, as I mentioned, this is engineering um, and we would like to have real translational impact. And so one of the metrics I've always said that we would hold ourselves to um, is things like licensing and startup activities. That's the evidence that you're really doing uh, research that um, has a chance to make a difference in people's lives. Well, I'm happy to report that MOLIES is, uh, again, going strong already. Uh, this is uh, from the clean tech side of the institute. They have been remarkable in generating new grants. Moly S has been uh, playing a role in helping uh, to make this happen through matching and uh, institute uh, building space. But they, they, they already have, have taken advantage of this. And, and that's what we all hoped would happen, that these faculty would come in. They would have great new space. They'd be talking to each other. Um, every day and making good things happen. And, and it really is already happening. We have major new programs that we already have new grants for, and it's very exciting to see. Um, the building snapshot, um, there's a biotech cluster on the, uh, on the tower. Um, there are four floors on the tower. Um, the biotech cluster is on the third and fourth floors. And we've already been able to use the building to recruit a really exciting new uh, faculty member in chemical engineering, uh, James Carruthers, from a really tough national competition. Uh, he actually did his postdoc in one of our speakers' labs today, Jay Kiesling's lab, one of the top synthetic biology labs in the world. Um, and, and so, again, this momentum and the power of working with a great group of faculty from across departments is really paying off already. Um, we also have the clean tech cluster you're going to hear from today. Super exciting. They've, they've really um, hit the, the, the institute floor running, um, and you'll be uh, seeing them and hearing from them today. 
Um, and then underneath, uh, there's a, a large footprint that is actually 35% of the building that you can see during our tour today that is the molecular analysis facility. And don't overlook that. It is a, a very important uh, part. Um, we have uh, three service centers already, um, NISAC Bio, which is an NIH-funded uh, center, it's professionally staffed, serves and is an interface with industry for uh, material surface analysis. We have the nanotech user facility that has moved over into molecular um, engineering building. I think this is going to impart new energy to that, um, which was already really impactful. We have a, a biotech a facility that interfaces uh, with companies like Amgen and others in the Seattle area. Um, and then we're going to have a synthetic biology collaboratory that's, I think, going to be very exciting. So things are happening, and uh, I just have to have one slide of my own. It's kind of a personal slide of uh, people who've been very important and I've really appreciated working with. Um, when I got started, uh, these were the two uh, uh, associate deans that I worked with very hard on the design of the building and worked through some really tough funding things. Um, uh, Greg Miller and Dan Schwartz, uh, they were the two associate deans for infrastructure and new initiatives and played a really key early uh, point. Um, they evolved into Mari uh, Ostendorf and Dave Kastner who finished up the building and played such a key role um, in, in getting it done and, and helping it get set up in the best way for the research. Um, on the construction side, this was a person I, I owe many margaritas to, Steve Tatchy, um, who, who had to be in there and interface in a very tough way between the construction people, those of us making demands and constant changes on the research side, and he was the daily person who uh, worked with us to get this done. Um, the other person, Michael Glidden, is so super secret that when I put up his name, the only thing I could find was Michael Phelps's picture. Um, so I'd put it in there. But Michael Glidden is the facilities uh, person in COE who really made it happen. Uh, Francois Banek, super important person. Uh, he's, he's one of the leaders uh, of the center. He is the director of the Center for Nanotech worked very closely with uh, me and really helped me personally and continues to help me figure out how to make the institute go over many cups of coffee. And lastly, Jill Fantner I want, is the uh, new program manager and she's the person who really has made everything click over the last year um, and put together the institute uh, from a management standpoint and, and Jill is um, up there uh, at the back of the room and should give her a big uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, from now, it should be easy, I think. We have great people, we have great administrative leaders, we have great space, we have great momentum, we have good coffee. Um, so, it's time to engage. Um, we have great momentum, and I think uh, today is going to be a wonderful official kickoff, as you'll see the type of people that we have at the Institute. So, I'm going to hand it over to uh, the morning's uh, session chair, uh, Dan Gamlin, who is one of our wonderful clean tech uh, faculty. He holds the Bowen um, Endowed Professor Chair in Chemistry. Um, he was recently elected to the AAAS, so congratulations on that. Um, Dan, that's a, a really nice uh, honor. And he's a key person of our clean tech uh, research group. So, uh, Dan, you can take over. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker today, Professor Pei Dong Yang who is the uh, S.K. and Angela Chan Distinguished Chair Professor in Energy at the University of California, Berkeley. And his primary affiliation is with the Department of Chemistry there, but he also has appointments in uh, material science and engineering at, and at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Now, Professor Yang is the Deputy Director for the Center of Integrated Nanomechanical Systems and recently has become the department head for the north site of one of the Department of Energy uh, um, Energy Innovation Hubs. And this is a major enterprise. This hub has as its focus um, artificial photosynthesis. So this is referred to as the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis, or JCAP, and their uh, emphasis is on the use of solar energy to generate uh, fuels, usable fuels. Professor Yang earned his PhD in chemistry from Harvard University, and he's been the recipient of many uh, awards and, and, and accolades, including the MRS Medal, the Bakelin Medal, Sloan Research Fellowship, 
um, the Springer Prize in Applied Physics, and the Waterman Award for the NSF. Uh, he's an MRS fellow, has been elected as a, a fellow of the AAAS. His main research interests have been in the area of one-dimensional semiconductor nanostructures uh, with applications in photonics and in energy research. So welcome, Professor. <laughs> Thanks, Stan. Um, first, I want to um, congratulate uh, colleagues here at uh, University of Washington for the launching of this uh, very exciting institute and the facility. Um, I'm sure this new facility and the new institute will greatly facilitate the collaborations among the groups and the faculties here across department and also across college, and they will lead lots of um, uh, great science here. So. Since this morning we are talking about clean tech, I changed the, uh, my <clears throat> the, the title of my talk into um, basically addressing uh, some of these um, nanowire technologies that are well developing in my, my group and how to basically use those technologies to address some of the energy problems we are facing. To start, basically, we're talking about um, in terms of energy need for the entire world is in, on the terawatts level. 15 to 20, 20 terawatts. And of course, at this moment, all of, most of those energy is coming from fossil fuel, and that creates um, certain uh, different, different level of problems. So in order to really create a um, cost-effective clean energy technology, we they basically we need to develop um, um, technology that's cost-effective, that's built upon on the Earth's abundant elements and also utilize less energy intensive process. So today I will actually share with you three um, short stories that's uh, coming out, out of from my own research group uh, trying to address some of these issues. Um, one of these uh, um, processes is based on the waste heat recovery, which means you want to recover some of the waste heat through developing nanostructural materials, and then I will move, um, uh, spend uh, most of uh, uh, time looking at the uh, solar energy conversion, uh, both including the photovortex and the solar fuel conversion. To start, let me actually touch upon on the thermal electric power cogeneration. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, I think, one, one of the areas that uh, nanotechnology can have a big impact. Okay. Now, if we look at uh, the the uh, whole process of power generation. Nowadays, we are looking at basically we need around 16 terawatts. And the more, as I said, most of those energy is coming from fossil fuel and coming out of the, from the power plant. And the efficiency of those um, uh, heat engine is around 40%. So in order to generate those 16 ter terawatts, you need input roughly 40 terawatts of um, uh, energy. And among those 16 terawatts is usable, and roughly 20 terawatts will be released to the environment as a waste heat. So the question is, if we can develop nano, uh, basically thermal electric materials that can convert or just use part of those waste heat, that would be fairly significant. Imagine if we can just have some thermal electric device, okay, that thermal electric materials basically can convert these um, heat gradient into the electricity. Okay? If the efficiency is just 3%, okay, that means you can easily recover roughly one terawatt. Okay? So the impact would be fairly significant. The question is, at this moment, we still don't have a suitable thermal electric materials that can do this job. Okay? In the past, I would say in the past five, six decades, many of research groups are trying to discover uh, cost-effective materials to do this job, and at this moment, most of the thermal electric materials are still used for just cooling purpose, okay? not for power cogeneration. Okay? Now, as I said, uh, in this area, the nanostructure semiconductor can play a significant role. When we talk about thermal electrics, one of the uh, very important physical parameters is called uh, ZT, okay? figure of merit. Okay? Uh, within this uh, parameter, we can see that uh, we have three fairly important physical properties we are looking at. One is the uh, S value and the sigma. Those are basically the thermal power and the electrical conductivity of the semiconductor. Okay? It's related to the ele electron transport within a semiconductor. 
Then the K, that's the thermal conductivity of the semiconductor, okay? So in principle, if we are looking at high efficiency thermoelectrics, ZT has to be as high as possible, okay? High ZT leading to high energy conversion efficiency, okay? So that means the thermal, the power factor on the electron transport part, you need to make it as large as possible, while the thermal conductivity needs to be as small as possible, okay? And which is sometimes we refer this as um, electron crystal and the phonon glass model. It's very hard to accomplish in the bulk semiconductor. And in my, my lab, we're basically looking, have been looking at the semiconductor nanowires. Okay? The reason for that is basically we're, we're developing this nanostructure into the dimension they are bridging these two very important um, length scale. One is phonon mean, mean free pass. Another one is electron mean free pass. Okay? For, for example, in the silicon case, okay, in the silicon case, phonon mean free, free pass is on the order of 200, 300 nanometer, while the electron mean free pass is on the order of like a couple of lat, uh, lattice constant in the nanometer region. Okay? So the basic design principle here is you design some nanostructure that's bridging those two length scales so that you can block the phonon transport, basically block the thermal transport, reduce the thermal conductivity, while encouraging the electron transport so that the thermal power would be as large as possible. Okay, so that's a basic design principle. So during this process, we start to explore the, the essentially the first thing is the size-dependent thermal conductivity of these one-dimensional silicon nanostructures. And immediately, you would notice that um, basically, you, if you look at the, 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 the plot in the right, that's bulk, basically the thermal conductivity for bulk silicon. And in, if we just look at the data for room temperature, we're talking about a couple of hundred watts per meter Kelvin. Okay? So that basically is telling you bulk silicon is a very good thermal conductor it's, no, it's never going to be a good thermoelectrics, okay? Now, if you reduce the dimension of the silicon nanostructure from 100 nanometer down to 20 nanometer, immediately you notice that thermal conductivity can be suppressed down to below 10 watts per meter Kelvin, okay? So you are basically designing nanostructure suppressing the thermal transport, and that's the beginning that basically we can really design nanostructure a semiconductor to to develop a better thermal, thermal electrics, okay? And then after a couple of uh, years of more efforts in terms of reducing the thermal conductivity, and then uh, very recently we developed this very simple process. It's a solution process of um, making these wafer scale silicon nanowire array on, let's say, on six inch wafer. And then the key feature here, actually, as I said on this slide, it's um, roughening of the silicon nanostructures. So, Beyond the size-dependent properties of thermal conductivity, we further incorporate the surface roughness on the silicon nanostructure to uh, further uh, suppress the thermal, thermal transport. And that leads into actually a very simple process of producing uh, nanostructure silicon uh, uh, materials that give you ZT value actually is 100 times larger than the bulk silicon. Okay? So ZT value for these um, Silicon nanostructure now we are getting into uh, close to 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and the processing is very, very simple. And that basically enables us to start to think about really utilizing silicon to do the thermoelectric power cogeneration. As now, finally, by nanostructure silicon, we can develop better thermoelectrics. Okay. So, three years ago, I started uh, this, this company, Alphabet Energy. Uh, and they, at this moment, um, we have uh, already actually hired 20 PhD uh, scientists in, in the lab with a fairly good uh, big facility in, in Hayward. And this, this company is uh, commercializing this very low-cost silicon-based thermoelectrical materials. And we are already at, um, after two years' efforts, we are already built up the thermoelectrical module. And the first custom pilot is just... Um, ongoing at this moment. So we are basically indeed making lots of progress in terms of just utilizing these nanostructure silic silicon materials for the waste heat recovery efforts. Okay. So now let, let me switch gear to another uh, part of um, um, sec, uh, research direction that I think these semiconductor nanostructure can contribute. It's, this is more, 
mostly on the solar energy conversion. I will tell you a short story on the PV side, and then spend most of our uh, time looking at the newer direction in terms of solar fuel generation. Okay. And the solar energy, of course, we have uh, lots of these um, energy we can tap into. The question is how we can come up with cost-effective uh, technology utilizing Earth's abundant elements. Since we're really tackle, tackling this terawatts level, so the, the, we always needed to emphasize utilizing Earth's abundant elements and also developing cost-effective technology. So back in... Uh, 2004, we introduced the first idea utilizing these um, semiconductor nanostructure, one-dimensional uh, structures as electrodes for this um, dye-sensitized solar cell. Back then, basically, we were utilizing these uh, single crystalline semiconductor nanowires to replace nanoparticle arrays. Okay? And then the major advantage utilizing these single crystalline channel as the electrodes is the enhancing of the charge, trans, uh, charge collection. Okay? Uh, if we measure the, for example, if we measure the electron diffusivity within the single crystal channel compared with nanoparticle, which basically is the electron while percolating the nanoparticles, the electron diffusivity in these uh, uh, single crystal channel is order of magnitude higher. Okay? So that's one of the advantages utilizing semiconductor nanowire array as the electrodes in the in the solar cell. Now, meantime, actually, if we look at many of these designs in terms of the nanostructured solar cell, you can list many of these advantages. Let's say you can design better um, a light absorber. Okay? You can have much better electron diffusivity. You can design these interface to facilitate the charge separation and charge transport. And you can introduce a light trapping phenomena. There are many different um, uh, advantages you can list, but at the end, may, most of these nanostructured solar cell design has one common feature, which is a high junction area, okay? which is very different from the conventional PV design. And this high junction area uh, feature within these nanostructured solar cell introduces one big problem, which has to do with the charge recombination. Okay? And that's basically is very hard to actually um, um, overcome within these um, high junction area solar cell. And that directly leads into in terms of the IV performance of these solar cell is typically in the nanostructured solar cell, the field factor is very low. VOC is lower compared to more traditional version of thin film or single crystal version of PV. Okay? And that explains many of these uh, um, results based on these um, nanostructured solar cells in terms of overall efficiency is typically quite low compared to the more traditional version of the solar cell. Uh, looking at this issue, Okay, how to really uh, utilize all of these advantages of nanostructured solar cell while trying to maintain much, basically maintain higher field factor and high VOC within these um, solar cells. Okay. And very recently, we come up with uh, one potential solution. And this, this uh, solution actually is um, very much compatible with our initial motivation. We want to develop a mild chemistry to make these Earth's abundant element-based solar cell while create these high-quality junctions, semiconductor junctions, so that we can high, have high energy conversion efficiency. And this example actually here is basically, we start with the catasulfide nanowire and utilizing this very low temperature cation exchange chemistry developed in um, Professor Olive Suttle's lab back in Berkeley. And this is all you need is basically dip these nanowires in a copper chloride solution at uh, 50 degree for a couple of seconds. You turn this wire into a junction, basically. The surface now becomes copper sulfide. It's a, car a copper sulfide, a cadmium sulfide junction. And the, through this process, then you can fabricate these, uh, these uh, core shell nanowires into a solar cell and start to measure their performance. Now, 
if you look at this performance of these nanostructures, I'm not going to spend too much time on those, uh, the, the, the two plots in, in the right, but mainly focused on this uh, IV uh, plot here. One, one of the features you may have noticed is that um, the IV looks very basically rectangular shape. Okay? And this, this shape basically is telling you that field factor of this particular device is quite amazing. Okay? Well, we are looking into the at um, 0.8. Okay? And typically, as I mentioned, many of these nanostructure solar cells were looking at in the past is the field factor was, would be in the region of 0.4 and 0.5. So this, is, this sort of field factor is very much approaching to the single crystalline the, in, in the traditional solar cell version. It's a, in the single crystalline version. Okay? So indeed, by utilizing the very mild chemistry, we demonstrate that we can create high quality semiconductor junction that minimize the carry recombination and maintain the high field factor within these nanostructures. So uh, it's possible, basically, we demonstrate that it's possible for high junction area solar cell, you still can have very high field factor and a VOC. Okay? And at this moment, this uh, first generation of the solar cell will have energy conversion efficiency roughly 6%. And this efficiency is largely uh, basically limited by the amount of visible light absorber we are having. Okay? And here the visible light absorber is copper sulfide. Okay? So at this moment for this 6% solar cell, we only have 10 nanometer of thickness in terms of the copper sulfide coating. Okay? So by increasing, we are now in basically pushing the they are increasing the thickness of these copper sulfide shell so that we can push this efficiency above 10%. And that's, um, that's actually, I think, it's uh, quite a promising direction. And uh, this basically tells you um, the uh, interface. Okay? <clears throat> Through this very mild cation exchange chemistry, we examine this interface between these two materials, cation sulfide and the copper sulfide. Indeed, they are very coherent. Not, not many uh, defects at the interface. And that's, I think, is the web brief. It's the key structure feature that gives us very high field factor in this, uh, solar, uh, in this nanowire solar cell. And these, uh, these uh, nanowire solar cells, uh, they are very reproducible. And if you look at um, um, linking actually many, a couple of these solar cells in series, in parallel, you can see more or less the, the individual device, the, the the performance is very much uh, similar. So you can either add up the voltage or add up the photo current, depending on how you link them. Okay? And this is actually, in many cases, particularly on the single nanowire level, it's uh, fairly hard to do, to make this identical device from wire to wire. And uh, this, again, actually illustrates that indeed we can utilize these earth abundant elements based material, utilize very mild chemistry, and create high quality junctions that give us high field factor in the VOC and eventually leads into uh, very high energy efficiency that um, one can um, um, basically push into the market. <coughs> okay, so that's basically one shorter story utilizing, by, uh, utilizing the core shell nanostructure by designing high quality interface to enhance energy conversion efficiency in terms of solar to electricity. Next, I want to actually uh, tell you the third story. That's the newest direction that we're pushing, utilizing this nanowire technology, which has to do with the, in one step, you convert the uh, sol solar energy to chemical fuel. So instead of the store energy as a form in, the, in the form of electricity, we want to store this energy in the chemical bond. Okay? So that basically solves the, in the solar cell, uh, in the PV industry, you have to worry about the energy storage, but if we can come up with this so-called artificial photosynthetic technology, then we don't need to worry about the storage because energy now is directly stored in the, in the chemical field. Okay. So the question is how we do it, okay. and typically what we are doing is we take gasoline, we drive our car, then emit CO2 in the water back into the environment. And the artificial photosynthesis is uh, Basically, the process that we want to convert the CO2 and the water back into the chemical field, okay? whether it's hydrogen, methanol, or all the way to the gasoline. Okay? And at this moment, we don't have this technology. Now, nowadays, uh, many, many countries, many research groups, uh, there are many research centers are attacking this very 
challenging issues, and this is also a fairly, I would say, in, in terms of research direction-wise, it's fairly res old research topic. It has been going on for many decades now. And there are, at, at this moment, there are still rem lots of remaining um, questions, remaining problems we have to uh, solve in order to really come up with a cost-effective artificial photosynthetic technology. Now, just look at the, the couple of these reactions, whether we are looking at solar water spreading to generate a hydrogen, okay, so you spread water into hydrogen and oxygen, or more challenging to, uh, direction would be you start with CO2 and the water and give you all of these different CO2 re um, reduction product, depending on you, you are doing the two electron, four electron, or six electron uh, reduction. Okay. So if you look at this whole process, and immediately you realize none of these reactions would be happening spontaneously. Okay. So you need energy input. So that's the solar energy. And then you need basically a uh, catalyst. Okay. So one thing that's very different from the photovortex, you utilize the semiconductor nanostructures for photovortex. In this area, we have to worry about two things. Okay. We need to design semiconductor nanostructure for the light harvesting. You generate the charges and separate them. Then instead of extract them out as electricity, you want to utilize those carriers to do reaction for you. Okay, so the next step, the second step, has to be highly coupled with the light, light absorption part, which has to do with the basic chemical reaction that catalyzed, catalyzed by the catalyst, whether it's water reduction, water oxidation, or CO2 reduction. Okay? So these two things have to be coupled within the final system. Okay? Um, so how can we do this, this whole thing more effectively? Okay? And this is something we can learn from nature. Okay? In nature, basically, the photosynthesis, photosynthetic process has two light, light capture events that's basically involving photosystem one and photosystem two. Okay? And this is the way that nature used to capture the whole visible spectrum. Okay? So in order to really utilize all the photons in the, in the solar spectrum, we need basically capture all the, all the longer wavelengths photons and utilize them for the chemical reaction. Of course, in the photosynthetic system, these two light capture events is coupled together two half reaction. One is the oxidation. Okay? That's oxidation part, basically you do the water oxidation, you generate oxygen over there. The other side is this, basically the reduction process has to do with the CO2 reduction, okay? and ultimately the chemical, uh, the energy is uh, stored in the, in the hydrocarbon. And um, for the uh, artificial photosynthesis, or more specifically, solar water spreading, the first example is coming out from Fujishima and Honda's group, that's uh, back in the 70s. And in this first example, they basically utilize the uh, TiO2, titanium oxide, to uh, drive the water, water spreading. And the reason for using, uh, in, this, in, this, in this case, the reason they are using this uh, TiO2, a uh, UV material, is TiO2 will give you enough photovoltage to drive those two half reactions. Okay. So if we look at the water reduction and the water oxidation, there are basically those um, uh, minimum energy you need to drive those two half reactions, 1.23 volts. Okay? Then any of these half reactions, you have over potential. So in, essentially, you need uh, typically, in terms of photovoltage from the semiconductor end, you need more, it, it typically would be more than 1.5 volts. Okay? So, TL2 as a UV material, it will give you enough photovoltage to drive those reactions. Okay? And unfortunately, if you are using TL2, you are only utilize UV photon. Okay? And if you are using only UV photon within the solar spectrum, then your ultimate energy conversion efficiency would be quite limited. Okay? So this technology is not going to eventually as the sort of viable technology. It, nonetheless, it demonstrates it's possible that utilizing these semiconductor structures, you can drive the solar, uh, basically drive the water spreadings, convert the solar energy, and store the energy in the form of hydrogen. Okay? But efficiency is very limited with this approach. So ultimately, we have to still learn from nature to utilize these two photon capture events. Okay? 
And this idea, again, is not new. It was proposed by Otto Nozick at Arel back in the 70s again. So in this case, we're talking about um, combining two semiconductors, two small band gap semiconductors. Okay? One is the P-type cathode, another one is N-type uh, anode. Okay? And this, this uh, so-called photoelectrochemical diode is a um, minority carrier-based uh, device. And the, these two small band gap materials, basically, both of them will contribute in terms of photovoltage. And the two photovoltage add up to drive the two half reactions for you. Okay? And this way, the semiconductor will capture the entire solar spectrum okay, and will drive those two half reactions. So P-type cathode, N-type anode, you dip into water, okay, you electrolyze. Okay? Then the, on the P-type side, the minority carrier electron will be used for the water reduction. On the N-type side, the minority carrier, which is a hole, will be used for the water oxidation. Okay? And then in the middle, basically, we need a transparent ohmic contact to make sure the majority carry would be recombined in the middle. Okay? So this design principle was actually proposed uh, back in the 70s, but uh, in reality, it wasn't uh, demonstrated. Okay? There, are, there are a couple of reasons behind that. One, mostly, is based on the lack of right materials. Okay? And um, lack of the semiconductors, lack of the suitable catalyst. <clears throat> so we basically started to um, look into this, uh, these issues, and uh, by also looking at uh, the, the nanotechnology that has been uh, developing in the past couple of decades, by incorporating these nanostructural semiconductors into that basic design, okay? and this is the uh, schematic drawing of this artificial photosynthetic system, okay, or solar field generator. So the key feature Actually, the key physics is very much similar to what has been proposed by Otto Nozick. But one structural feature we're incorporating here is the high surface area semiconductor. Okay. Um, why the high surface area semiconductor is important in terms of the putting, actually incorporate into this, this device as a photoelectrodes, I will give you some concrete number a little bit later. But in this design, basically, we have High surface area semiconductor nanowire array on the top, that basically is our photo anode. Okay? When the water comes in, basically that's where the water oxidation will, will be happening. Okay? And these uh, high surface area semiconductor anode will be decorated by these water oxidation catalysts. Okay? So there will be an interface between the nanowire and oxidation catalyst. Okay? And in the bottom, that's the photo, photo cathode. Okay, photo cathode is where the water reduction or CO2 reduction will be happening. Okay? So that, that's going to be another small band gap semiconductor. It's high surface area. It will be decorated by water reduction or CO2 reduction catalyst. Okay? So ultimately, the product will be hydrogen and or methanol. Okay? Then in between, again, you will have to make sure that you have ohmic contact. And in the final, eventually, in the final device, these two electrodes need to be separated by a polymer membrane, ion conductor polymer membrane to separate the hydrogen and oxygen. Okay? So that's a, a generic design of this solar fuel generator. Again, the question is what would it be the suitable material, what would it be a suitable catalyst for this, um, for this final system level integration? <coughs> by looking at this, this design, one would immediately realize what sort of materials are needed. Okay? So First of all, we need a photo cathode. Okay? On the bottom, bottom side, that's the photo cathode materials for water and CO2 reduction. So in that case, basically, you need a small band gap materials, give you enough photovoltage still, but the con you have to have suitable conduction band edge for those two re reduction half reaction. Okay? Similarly, on the photo anode end, we need to develop a small band gap photo anode. Okay, with a suitable valence band edge. And those are actually, in, if, if we look at many of the existing semiconductors, it turns out the photoanode material is much, much more challenging. Okay? And of course, both semiconductor has to be stable when you immerse the semiconductor in water with one sun in radiation. Okay? It's for, it has to be photochemically stable. So that's a basic requirement for these uh, high surface area photocathode and photoanode. 
Then, of course, the semiconductor basically is taking care of the light absorption. You have to have suitable catalysts to interface with those semiconductors to utilize these carriers. So water reduction, water oxidation, CO2 reduction. In each of these half reactions, you need to develop catalysts with very high turnover frequency to match the solar flux, okay? And uh, as much as possible, lower over potential so that the photo voltage you are extracting from the semiconductor is not wasted. Okay? Now, why the, uh, the, actually this slide actually illustrates the, um, the, the advantage of utilizing two light absorbing uh, semiconductor compared to the very first example of the TiO2 using one semiconductor. If you are using one semiconductor only, okay, just like the TiO2 or me, more recently people are looking at gallium nitride as well, because of the photo voltage requirement, you only can utilize the, um, in the solar spectrum, well, you only can utilize the UV region, okay? So the, theoretically, the maximum photo current output would be very limited, okay? Because of limited UV photon in the solar spectrum, it's basically, you can uh, reasonably assume when the band gap is smaller than 2.5 volts, this, this semiconductor will not be able to drive those two half reaction, okay? But now if you are utilizing two small band gap materials, one is photocathode, one is photoanode, that by combining their photo voltage, essentially you can absorb the whole, in, whole solar spectrum, utilize the, all the longer wavelength photons. Uh, uh, photons. <coughs> then the theoretically, the maximum photo current density can be very high. So, for example, in this case, we're basically expecting the photo current output can be 20 milliamp per square centimeter. Okay? And if you can utilize those, all the 20 milliamp per, per square centimeter current for water spreading or for CO2 reduction, that means in terms of the ultimate solar to hydrogen energy conversion efficiency can be very high. Okay? So it's 20 times 1.23, it's 24%. So theoretically, the solar to chemical fuel energy conversion efficiency can indeed be pretty high as long as we can come up with the right material here. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples on the photo uh, cathode and, uh, and also our recent efforts on the photo anode. <coughs> on the photo cathode end, actually we have a couple of good material. One is the silicon nanowire array because these are, looks like very black silicon. These are all highly oriented nanowire array. They are black because they have this sort of light trapping phenomena inside, okay? Um, they are very high surface area. You can decorate with um, water reduction catalysts, for example, palladium or moly sulfide in these cases, and they utilize them as photocathode for water reduction, okay? And typically, these silicon nanowires, if you engineer the interface, you can reasonably extract in terms of photo voltage-wise is up to 400 millivolts or slightly above 400 millivolts, and the current density can be around 20 milliamp per square centimeter as a photocathode. Okay? So we do have some uh, good photocathode material. Now, if you replace silicon with our more recent indium phosphide nanowire array, the current density can be go up to 30 milliamp per square centimeter. Photo voltage can go up to 700 millivolts. Okay? So that's pretty decent from the photocathode end. Okay? Um, now, the, uh, if you are thinking about CO2 reduction, as I mentioned, if you are doing CO2 reduction, the conduction band uh, edge needs to be more negative because the CO2 reduction half reaction uh, is much more negative compared to the water, water reduction. So one of the good material in this case in terms of the, having the right uh, conduction band edge is the gallium phosphide. So we, for this purpose, we develop a very simple surfactant-free colloid process to make these gallium phosphide nanowires. Okay? And we can basically made, make all these high surface structure in solution now, very low cost uh, methodology for both actually for water reduction and the CO2 reduction. Okay? Now with this slides, I want to illustrate why the, the importance of the surface area. Okay? <clears throat> Of course, using nanowires, we have advantage of a high charge mobility that's already demonstrated in our, uh, in our solar cell device. But more importantly for the solar fuel generation, high surface area, because 
we need to run catalyst, uh, basic catalysis for water reduction, water oxidation. So surface area is very important. Okay? Imagine we are having basically from the semiconductor we are extracting just 10 milliampere square centimeter. Okay? That means roughly if you are dealing with planet electrodes, you are sending 600, 600 electrons every second over one nanometer square. Okay? If you are dealing with thin film or single crystal version of this, uh, this um, uh, combined electrodes, okay? and that's basically dictated the turnover frequency of the catalyst. Okay? It's very, too hard, very hard to find a water, particular water oxidation catalyst and a CO2 a reduction catalyst with that high turnover frequency. Okay? But now if you turn, the, ev turn everything into high surface area electrodes, okay? from the planet electrodes to nanowire array, by increasing surface area, you can decrease by stacking. Basically, you have the capability to stack the catalyst along the Z direction. You can basically immediately reduce that into, for example, six electrons every second over one nanometer, uh, over one nanometer square. Okay? And that's durable. Okay? That uh, basically is a durable target for the water reduction. Of course, for the water oxidation and the CO2 reduction, we are still far, far off from that target. Okay? So that's a reasonable target, given that uh, if we are indeed utilizing high surface uh, semiconductor electrodes, okay? and we indeed actually being able to measure exactly how many electrons or how many carry we are generating from these single nanowire uh, experiment. Okay? What we are looking at here is basically uh, essentially three by three individually addressable photo silicon nanowire photo cathode. And then we can actually, under one sun irradiation condition, we can measure how many electrons you are generating, okay? Um, basically, how many electrons you are sending to the silicon surface in the electrolytes, okay? So through this measurement, we are basically measuring for each of these single nanowires, we are generating 20 to 30 picoamp, okay? And then if you map out the whole surface area of silicon nanowires, we are more or less generating any, around 10 electrons Okay, every second, and basically send out onto the silicon nanowire surface. Okay. So that's the, actually, this is, I think, the, in terms of the number 10 here, that's the reasonable target for, the, for many of the catalyst development, whether it's for water reduction or water oxidation and CO2 uh, reduction. Okay. And that's basically the, it's a, it's a target for the, for the catalyst community to develop those catalysts with the tunnel frequency matching with the solar flux. And then you can basically, by developing these uh, high surface, surf, surface area nanostructure, you can start to think about interface with the catalyst. In this case, we're looking at interface gallium phosphide nanowire with um, one fairly powerful water reduction catalyst, molecular sulfide cubing molecule. Okay? And at this moment, in terms of the activity-wise, it's comparable to, in this case, you can see that it's comparable to like 2% loaded PT sample. Okay, so moly sulfide eventually we believe will be used as a very efficient um, water reduction catalyst. Um, and these are related to the more details about uh, these moly sulfide catalysts. And indeed, through the, through the more of these uh, research uh, experiment, we've discovered that the most active, actually at the end, the active water reduction catalyst is amorphous networks amorphous network of moly sulfide. It's not like you put in moly sulfide cubing molecules, they are stable. They typically decompose through these, these uh, after the um, photocatalytic water uh, reduction. At the end, those uh, amorphous network is still very active for water, re water reduction, okay? So that's, uh, that's, that's on the photocathode and the water reduction end. On the photoanode end, uh, it's much more challenging. As I mentioned, in the photocathode, we can easily get up to 700 millivolts in the photovoltage. Photocurrent can be 30 milliamp per square centimeter. On the anode end, we don't have such material. The silicon doped iron oxide from Mike Grezo's group can go up to, through many of these um, uh, experiments, can go up to 3 milliamp per square centimeter, but it's far off in terms of the photovoltage. And we have been actually uh, experimenting with different high surface area electrodes, utilizing the photocathode and the photoanode end while using TL2 as our uh, model system. Okay, we basically develop these uh, hydrothermal process to make the TL2 nanowire array. 
And these TL2 nanowire actually right now, even though they are UV material, they can still give us more, more than one milliamp per square centimeter, okay? And it's the UV material. That's the limiting factor here. By plotting these, uh, the photo response of the photo cathode and the photo anode, okay? And that um, in, the, in, in the right up corner, that's the, the, um, the blue curve is the photo cathode, the silicon, and the, the uh, yellow, yellowish col colored curve is for TL2, okay? And by simply combining the silicon TL2 nanowire array, at a zero bias, we can get up to basic current density of around 0.4 milliamp per square centimeter, basically, in the one sun irradiation, okay? And that's essentially corresponding to solar to hydrogen energy conversion efficiency is roughly 0.5, 0.6%, okay? And then we can basically do the spontaneous water spreading now <coughs> by simply combining a silicon nanowire array and a TL2 nanowire array, okay? That's the, uh, with the efficiency up to 0.5, 0.6%. And by looking at this, uh, this, um, uh, photo response, you may realize what's the limiting factor. The limiting factor is a photo anode, okay? So I think I, my time is, um, is um, running short. I, very quickly, I will show you two examples of a new semiconductor material we're developing. One is this low temperature chemistry we're developing for gallium phosphide, okay? We were able to um, utilize a similar chemistry, but this time by mixing a silicon precursor to make an alloy compound gallium phosphide silicon alloy with tunable binder gap now, okay? This is a new composition, gallium phosphide silicon, and the, the binder gap now can be tunable, tunable back to the two EV, okay? So this is a one uh, uh, um, photoelectrode material uh, with a new composition, and it's metastable. It does not exist in thin film form. Another new composition, again, does not exist in the bulk form, only exists in these high surface area electrodes, is indium gallium nitride structures with two, again, with tunable binder gap, okay? Both materials, basically, we're exploring them as the suitable photo, uh, photo, photo electrode materials, okay? And with that, I want to put this slide up there as the sort of the remaining challenges in terms of solving this artificial photosynthesis problems. We need a Def definitely needed to find out better photoanode materials with small band gap, with small band gap, but give us very high photo voltage and the photo current density. Okay? And finally, I want to thank my group for the hard work in developing this uh, nanowire technology for the energy conversion purpose. Okay? And uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you.